We are now on to a magnificent panel. Um, they're all magnificent, um, to be fair with you. Um, so this is on a very, very important topic. Obviously, what we touched about with Jason just now on change management, it was referenced quite a few times um, earlier on today uh, in a number of panels. I think any technology integration is based on the user adoption. And I think that's, again, reinforced from what Jason said. So um, I will pass you on to um, Brian Brian Kaus, sorry, uh, Business Improvement and Optimization Commercial for Philips 66 to moderate this. Really looking forward to it and over to you, Brian. Thanks, Adam. Uh, looking forward to the panel. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Kaus. I, as Adam said, Commercial Business Improvement for Philips 66. For those of you that don't know, Philips 66 is a uh, global energy manufacturing company um, with presence in midstream commercial specialties, refining and marketing and uh, operate and have business around the world. Uh, today, we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, a different side of the technology that you've all been hearing about. Technology is a, a core part of the evolution of how we achieve results. Um, so technology and innovation offers promise uh, and potential. It's our from earth to the moon. In the energy industry, we're experiencing energy, chemicals, oil and gas. We're experiencing a transformation that is redefining our competitive effectiveness. And that's what we're hearing a lot about here today um, across this future downstream. This is not necessarily new. Technologies and advances in analytics, such as digital twin and AI, uh, blockchain, and many other uh, advances in technology have been core to nearly all of the advances in oil and petrochemicals um, across the last decade. But innovation and downstream are not necessarily two terms that we typically hear together. Um, in fact, I would argue in many cases, we tend to have a death grip on the status quo, as I shared with some of my panelists, um, relative to other industries. It's a fear of the unknown, it's new technologies. Um, however, times are changing. The future is faster than you think. Um, and, and technology and innovation is no longer something we're reserved for the periphery, but it's become part of the core necessity of how we compete. It's the price of admission to the game. It's essential to competing in the ever-changing global markets that we face. Realizing potential, though, goes, simply, goes beyond simply embracing innovation it's create, and creating new technologies. It's very much tied to the how. For all the wonderful technological advances and possibilities, we are limited. Unlocking that potential and that at the enterprise level determines the future of our success or our failures. In some cases, it's actually the very survival of our business. In order to achieve that, we must change psychologically and culturally in our approach, how we think, how we train, how we test, how we share, how we communicate. In many ways, embracing the softer skills and strategic thinking that enables us to empower organizations, people, and individuals, and translate that latent potential into results and a culture that emphasizes continual learning. The ability to effectively adapt this is the difference between the winners and the losers in a high stakes game as competition accelerates. Joining me today are a number of thought leaders across this space with global reach and presence and diversity of thought. In our brief time, we'll explore some of the themes outlined here earlier. And from the overreaching technical examples uh, to some of the themes of how we get this done, we'll touch on the successes and the hurdles and the pass forward necessary to become more agile, adaptive, and responsive to the changes and build the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce and welcome the panel. Um, if you would, maybe quick introductions all around. Let's start with you, Alessandro. Yeah, pleased to meet you, uh, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, fellow panelists. My name is Alessandro Pistillo. I'm working in the Corporate Development Department of BSF. Which is, a, which is a chemical company for those of you who may not know it. Um, and I'm dealing with uh, digital, digital transformation. Um, I will be very keen on uh, exchanging with you about some of the transformation, ch transformation challenges that we have ahead of us in terms of decarbonization and uh, how digital technology can help in uh, moving to that direction. Um, happy to be here. Great. Elgin? 
Good morning, good afternoon, Elgin Suggs. I am the Director of Operations Excellence at McDermott International. I've been with our organization for over 17 years and most recently, I have been leading digital culture and transformation in our organization as we are embarking upon a digital transformation journey. And it's exciting to be able to talk about culture with my fellow panelists and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great, Rahil. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, Rahil Burhani, uh, I'm CIO at SR Oil UK Limited. Been in this role for about four years now. I've been working for SR earlier uh, in their other industries in power and uh, steel and oil and gas. So I've been into most of the time, I have been into energy industries, energy utilities, power and uh, oil and gas mostly into doing technology implementations, technology strategy roadmaps. Uh, that's me. And I'm looking, really looking forward to a very nice conversation. Great. Jason. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jason Gislason. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Chevron Phillips Chemical Company. I've got about 25 years experience in the uh, oil and gas chemicals industry and have a I guess recently joined CPCM in order to come over and lead their digital transformation. So we've been um, transforming for about a year and a half now. I uh, came over from Phillips 66 uh, and uh, it le led parts of the digital transformation there. So um, I think change management, uh, you know, I, I would even extend it into user experience design, but that, that front end adoption and use with and engagement with your users is absolutely the most critical part of technology adoption. Um, and um, I'm really enjoying uh, engaging with everyone in those discussions. I look forward to the panel and I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. Excellent. We have it. Yeah, Howard Ostensen. I'm here with Kongsper Digital, uh, representing kind of a technology side uh, from a supplier perspective. And uh, uh, we have since about 2016, 17, uh, invested in Digital Twins as a product to be able to better serve the industry in terms of providing relevant services into the industry surrounding this uh, digital twin ecosystem that I'm you know, very pleased to report has transformed from a why do this narrative into a let's get together and figure out how to get this done. So, uh, so yeah, about myself, I have about 17 years of experience with technology attached to the energy industry, uh, various companies. Uh, I'm really excited about what's about to happen now which I think we're at the cusp of uh, large at scale development of digital solutions to actually meet business needs in this particular segment. So very pleased to be here. Thanks for facilitating the session. Great, yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, we're at a very critical inflection point and so there's a lot of op opportunity here. Excited to get the panel going here. Uh, for those listening, we're going to, this is going to be a very conversational panel. We'll touch on some of the, the high level and, and overview type elements of engagement from change management. And we'll talk about some specifics within uh, systems and things that have been implemented in terms of uh, some carbon uh, capture process, uh, reporting and uh, digital twin. But most importantly, we want this to be an open dialogue. So if you have any questions, please submit them uh, in the chat and we'll make sure that those get addressed. Uh, as quickly as possible. So let's just kick this off to the panel and, and just say, so we want to start with change management. And maybe Jason, you want to take the, the lead on this. Um, just so change management is something that I don't know that we always assign. It's, it's a little bit mythical in some sense. We have a notion of what it means, but successfully implementing change management across an enterprise is a little bit more challenging than many expect. And that's where we see a lot of pitfalls. So having done this at multiple enterprises, look, take a stab at and give us some insight into what works, what doesn't, and how we can bridge that. And then I would open that up to the rest of the panel to chime in on, on what you see in terms of successes and failures. So Jason, take it away. Yeah, you know, I think change management, one of the, the keys to success now is moving it as far upstream of the project as you possibly can. So in, you know, historically, you think about what change management was. It was really an activity whether they did after the development of the project in order to increase adoption. Uh, it, was, it was communications and training a lot of times. And I think that's um, a historical misconception that, um, that that is sufficient. 
Uh, these days, things are changing so rapidly. Uh, the tools are so complicated and the change required to be adopted by an individual using some of these new machine learning and AI tools um, is, is so vast yes. that you need to really engage the people uh, you know, right in the beginning. And um, if you can engage them and meet their needs up front, design the tools with them as you're going along so that they understand exactly how they work and what the pitfalls are, and then are comfortable using those tools, they then become those super users within the field that are that have credibility, that have um, the ability to, to very clearly speak to how the systems work and can bring other people along. And so it's it's really getting those champions, it's working with those champions right up front and identifying really strong business leadership that can facilitate the change. Great. Any anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll add to that uh, what Jason said. I think that was uh, well said. Um, I'd even like to extend it a bit further than like the initial developments of your your business application and say you know we really need to start a movement in terms of digital transformation you know define the why why is it important to the project why is it important to you as the end user why is it important to the organization i think if we can clearly define the why then our end users can rally around the why and be more open to adopting this change in technology great point can I yeah, can I add here? Yeah. So I think change management, we talk about as if it is something which is not me and someone else have to be changed. I think that's the bigger myth, actually. I mean, we all have to change as an organization. So it's, I believe when we, when we talk about change management in a project, we always think that the people who are driving the project are trying to change someone else, actually. I think we, we usually, I don't, I try to keep away from that that notion actually and i try to drive it as a more of a continuous improvement model where we all evolve together actually so it's not just the end user community who has to evolve the people who are working on the project enabling the project supporting the project also have to evolve in their methods in their ways of looking at things so that's that's my take on that sure yeah uh, Alessandro, do you have any anything to chime in on that? Yeah, I can I can only um, confirm that uh, uh, well, change management at the end of the day is uh, um, fundamental to be successful in in any sort of transformation uh, process um, and uh, um, involving and following this approach of. Uh, um, um, identifying change agents and uh, and champions for the initiatives inside the company is fundamental um, for 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 success and uh, to have an effective uh, rollout and uh, um, internalization of the initiative in the DNA of the company at the end. So I, I can only echo what I heard, what I what I heard before. Um, uh, I don't know whether. Uh, this applies also to Harvard experience. Yeah, I mean, sure. So we, so I, I work in a technology company, and we get really excited about technology. And then, if you don't, if you don't get this right, then you have potentially a great technology out there, but that no one's really using. So, so there are a few observations that we have across the board, really. And I think number one is just it needs to be elevated strategically. So, what that translates to is really both the, the top-down endorsement, but also kind of the bottom-up championing that was mentioned earlier here. Both have to exist so that you can truly know that you're on this collective journey and that everything is kind of contributing to the same direction and the same narrative that people can identify with. And, and, and what we have seen then is that there are big industry narratives like remote operations, like transforming downstream assets into end green energy parks, expanding about what it means to be a downstream operator. And then you have the backdrop of net zero, but people from the ground up, they connect with their business performance metrics that they are associated with. So if you're working on a hydro cracker, you're gonna look at performance metrics around that unit, right? So, so it's about connecting it together, but we have seen the necessity of top down and bottom up working together at the same time. 
And then I think the last point that we have observed is that if you don't see it, if you don't, if you can't observe the change and see what's happening and understand the value of the data, and, and if not everyone sees the same thing, then you will have problems mobilizing people. So, so what we're trying to help stimulate first is to try to create visibility of the data and information that you have so that you can improve your work processes. So that's really about kind of a col making a collective shift forward that's meaningful on every level of the organization. It's really tricky to do, but, but you can actually get some help from technology there. Jason, I know you wanted to build on that. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I, I thought it was very insightful what um, Havard had said is, you know, two things that really rang true to me is you have to be able to see the transformation that you're trying to engage in and that you're trying to to uh, to affect. And um, and it has to go all the way from the top all the way to the bottom of the organization across the entire organization. And um, I like I, I recently heard a quote that I hadn't heard before from Louis Pasteur. It said fortune favors the, the well prepared mind. And I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that a lot of times our organizations and the organizations that we deal with outside of our organizations um, aren't upskilled or prepared yet to recognize the potential benefits associated with the technologies that we can provide. And so one of the things that we have to do to, to kind of make the organization more nimble, make ourselves more nimble, like, like was mentioned, it's a, it's a transformation of all and a, and a change of all of us together. It's, it's, help provide insights, prepare people's minds to be thinking about the possibilities so that they recognize opportunities. And I think that up through upskilling, training, um, coaching, uh, you know, these mentor networks, I think it makes a big difference in the way that a company can absorb transformation in technology. And uh, everything we can do to kind of build off of that capability really helps out. Excellent point, Jason. I, I think that's a, that's a key as we think about how to uh, execute and unlock that value of the, the potential, the inherent potential. How do we get the enterprise to embrace that and discover the things that we, we don't even know are possible today? And I think we'll dig into that a little bit later on in the conversation, perhaps a little bit more. But as, as we before we move on to the next uh, round of questions, you know, one of the things we've talked about what success looks like. Um, but having engaged in some of these these initial transformations and, and transitions and adoption of new technologies, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to capture where we've seen some pitfalls. Where are the gaps and how do we bridge that to the success? Does anybody have any examples that you'd like to share in terms of, of what those pitfalls are in terms of how ingrained and how how much we cling to what we know and how do we overcome that inherent embedded practice and move on to the next phase. So we're agile and able to embrace that value. And any I third can, rail, uh, anybody? Go ahead. I can share some of my failures actually, where in some of the projects when we saw that we try to try to adopt a new technology, but we try to use copy paste for putting the new system trying to make the new system work like the old system, but only a new, new on a new platform. I think that's a big pitfall actually I've seen. And despite trying to work with change agents in the organization, the ability of the change agent to see the wider picture is, is, is something we need to help them to develop actually. And that's very difficult work actually, because we need to train, we need to bring them into conferences. We need to you know engage them with the outside world uh, that's 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 a very big pitfall. Copy paste is a very very big pitfall which we have seen, and I have seen a couple of small projects. The end result and the outcome, even after adopting a new technology, did not give us very massive results. Now we learn from that, and we have tried to change that a lot actually as we go along in our projects. So that's all. I think that's an extra excellent point. There's no innovation without without failure, and we have to get comfortable with that. Uh, which is probably a very uncomfortable for many of us. Any any other thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, another another classical down. pitfall is. Sorry about that. Uh, for, go ahead, is, go ahead Alessandro. Alessandro, you have the floor. 
another classical pitfall is to focus too much on on the technology and the and the and the pro product um, and rather less on uh, to, not not enough on the people which is uh, which is eventually the using uh, that technology so focus on the user um, and i think that uh, um, uh, the uh, Agile development spreading now into uh, into an all uh, project management uh, uh, cases that we uh, we face today. Um, we, we we noticed that uh, um, an involvement of the user in, already in a design phase um, is uh, also uh, helping uh, to avoid this pitfall and uh, uh, have a better rate of success in the transformational initiatives. Pavard, did you, did you have something else you wanted to add there? It sounded like you were chiming yeah. in before. Sure, yeah, it, it's a bit of continuation. So once you grab people's attention, right, don't lose it because people have sky high expectations now and we're all guilty of this, right? If we are on some type of technology in our private life and it fails, we just, and it fails twice, we never use it again. So, so this has kind of come into our digital space uh, here too so we we deploy digital twins and you know there have been in, incidents where you know if you have not focused enough on user empathy and the user experience right there and then when people are starting to adopt the tool people will just drop off right so you have to remember that that time in the spotlight right at the beginning the first impression is so important and you need to really start investing in people all the way from the beginning i think this goes back to what jason was saying with really early user engagement but there are some really critical moments that matter where you can you can get a lot of user engagement and enthusiasm and, and momentum, or you can drop off because of technical details, right? So these launch uh, times and being exposed to the technology for the first time, those are moments that are critical. So get get that initial engagement right. Invest in it. Excellent. I think that's a that's a great point. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we've talked about change management and, and how do we advance those? I think that's a good pivot to the next level questions that we have here. So how do we, how do we embrace those, those workforce digital competencies to create programs that have meaningful impact? Um, and, and we've touched on that. I think it's about creating that culture of, of continuous learning where we have attitudes that, and behaviors that drive change and allow people to see and capture digital innovation, like I said, beyond what we know now, there are a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of un, un, unknown opportunities that we can identify and unlock and, and pursue. So with that, you know, I wanted to pivot over, Alessandro, I know that you had some, some insights that you wanted to talk about in terms of some programs that you've actually pursued and maybe kind of give us some, some insight into what that looks like and how you've been successful in implementing that and the, the impact that it's had within the organization. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, actually, I was thinking to um, reading it as the title also of this panel, uh, Digital Sustainability and Culture Management. I was thinking about uh, bringing a case study um, of, a, of, of an initiative that uh, we have uh, kicked off last year um, and uh, a project which was actually leaving uh, and starting three years ago, but uh, it started to get uh, got beyond the, the boundary of our company uh, last year um, and is an example of uh, um, eventually uh, change management of course we were discussing before but even more uh, an example of uh, another critical aspect of uh, uh, business paradigm today which is a collaboration collaboration between uh, uh, between different companies and between companies within an industry or even beyond an industry it's uh, uh, the trigger point of the initiative and what we are basically talking about is uh, um, how to find ways to um, uh, collaborate as an industry and to uh, reduce together the carbon footprint and, uh, uh, and cope with uh, one of the biggest global challenges ahead of us, which is decarbonization, which is top of mind for any company, especially in an energy intensive industry like the chemical or the petrochemical or the refinery industry is. 
So um, if we, if, yeah, thanks for, for sharing, sharing this slide. This is just a couple of slides meant to be a, an impulse and then perhaps trigger a conversation. Um, the initiative was, uh, uh, I was mentioning is basically uh, um, the establishment of, a, of, of, of an ecosystem which uh, helps to um, uh, have a, um, and supports in, the in a real data-driven and net zero transformation any potentially interested companies. So let's, let's try to focus on the problem first. Next slide, please. Um, so that decarbonization is a, is a necessity for, uh, for, for, for everybody. Uh, I mean, this is not to be, to be debated, uh, but that decarbonization is, uh, is if it needs to be not just a, a top-down initiative, but uh, um, should be actually driven uh, by by behavior, right? By, by uh, cultural behavior, uh, behavior of a um, of a consumer. Uh, so everybody of us in a supermarket aisle choosing the products which are uh, uh, more environmentally friendly, right? Uh, or even in a B two B context, uh, uh, a procurement uh, person um, selecting one or the other suppliers, taking also quantitative factors measuring the emission impact of a, of a, of, of a product uh, into account. So uh, how can we um, push decarbonization driving behavior? We need quantitative uh, instruments at hand and the product carbon footprint is a KPI which measure exactly that, measure the impact of a, of a, uh, of a product, any product, uh, um, on the um, on the climate change, so the the the, the amount of uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions which have been associated to the manufacturing and the use even of that particular product. Um, so how can we get to this target state, right? A target state where a procurement person can use product cover for print to uh, guide this decision, or anybody of us in a supermarket to decide what to buy and what not to buy. Next slide, please. Um, well, uh, then you need to calculate and eventually put a label on a product. So you need to put a product cover for print information on a, pro on, 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 on a packaging at the end of the day, most likely, or in a QR code that every people can then uh, read on, on this uh, mobile phone. Um, but how to put such a, such a number, uh, let's, uh, it's just, just just an example, right? Uh, a hypothetical uh, toothpaste. Um, now um, you will hardly find a toothpaste like this with a uh, put on it the uh, carbon footprint of the toothpaste um, on a supermarket because basically today is a tremendous challenge to do that. Uh, why cannot toothpaste company uh, put this number on the packaging? Because simply. Um, uh, to put this number requires a collaborative effort along the value chain and exchange of data. We simply are not there. Next slide it will indicate exactly uh, uh, the very uh, um, the, the very concerning situation where we are. Uh, and we, we notice as our company been active in so many uh, downstream industries. Um, what are the challenges? There are no real standards or standards which really help to do an apple to apple comparison of product for product carbon footprints yes there are iso standard iso frameworks but they're very very generic so that um, eventually you can say yes i'm following iso but uh, you have apple and oranges to compare you have very little data out there so many companies uh, do not have uh, uh, extensive data banks and data informations on the product carbon footprint of their the product they sell or the product they buy. And very often, this is because companies do not have exactly the uh, data about uh, the carbon footprint of the raw materials that they purchase. And why that? And not only because data are not available very often, but also because there are no systems or digital twins let you, using one of the expressions that had been uh, uh, um, just uh, uh, mentioned by Ava before. Uh, there are no real uh, system so far to have an efficient tra um, uh, transfer of data of this type of data across company boundaries. Now, how to address these challenges? Uh, 
Uh, next slide, uh, we can give a little bit of glimpse of uh, the initiative, so the, the approach that uh, um, we have been following in our company, and uh, we are very happy to share this approach um, with, uh, with other industries, uh, like also the, the refinery industry, because it could be um, helpful also for other industries um, um, in order to improve the situation and get to this target state of, a, of, a, of, a, of, of everybody of us going to the supermarket and being able to uh, buy uh, um, sustain with sustainable consciousness. Um, so we need standards, as said. Um, I would say collaboration is the key words here. We should have, uh, I mean, we really recommend to have uh, um, uh, companies joining forces um, within a certain industry and homogeneous industry scope and define the rules of the game. How should a product carbon footprint be calculated uh, for, for a given product, for a given um, product uh, manufactured by, by a refinery, for example? Right, so for a refinery product or for a petrochemical product, um, we have developed something in the for the for the chemical space, uh, which we are sharing with a lot of our peers right now, um, um, openly. So it's open source uh, methodology, which uh, um, which could with some modification be uh, adopted also in the refinery context. Um, on the data availability. Um, Topic so data scarcity. How to improve that? Well, a company needs digital solution, digital tools to uh, perform life cycle assessment analysis in an efficient time and in, in short time and uh, and little investment. This you cannot be done with a conventional uh, um, consulting approach, which has been used in the, in the recent years. Um, because if you have several thousands of products you sell, uh, you cannot afford to have. Uh, Thousand of LCA done every 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 month or every year, just, just or every every month or or even every week in order to um, um, to steer your business into a direction which is uh, um, which is uh, driving towards uh, uh, decarbonization. So you need digital tools. Um, we have developed a digital solution which is named Scott, um, and this digital solution is is something that we are currently sharing with the market, we are bringing with the market in a way that we have licensed Scott, which has been developed as, a, as, a, um, as an internal tool in BSF, capable to calculate 45,000 for a couple of footprint for our entire global portfolio in less than one hour. And um, we have licensed this to software companies, which are now capable to, uh, to uh, bring this solution into any other interested companies in the chemical or the process industry space. But then, and that's um, what I'm closing the loop on the topic of uh, uh, collaboration. Um, you, you, industry needs to find way to exchange data in a secure manner. So um, again, topic digital twin or um, uh, data exchange platforms. And on this, I really encourage um, companies to uh, join forces with peers. Um, that's what uh, in the chemical industry we are currently doing in uh, together for sustainability. Um, I mean, some uh, some oil companies and pet chem companies are part of it as well. Um, basically, it's an organization um, where multiple chemical companies, 40 global large chemical companies, have joined forces to set standards and set uh, also systems to exchange in a secure way. Um, uh, information like uh, uh, product carbon footprints, but there are many other initiatives uh, launched in, in, in other contexts, like in the automotive field. Um, I would encourage you to have a look at Catena X or um, the World Business Council of Sustainable, Sustainable Development, WBCSD, has, has also been uh, working in this direction. And um, uh, again, to close with what I was starting, collaboration. Uh, among companies operating in the same space, so assuming multiple refinery companies joining forces, defining standards and, and, and systems and solutions, is uh, I think uh, a way to go to address and to contribute to these uh, global challenges ahead of us. I would stop now, uh, hopefully having done a little bit of an uh, impulse on this and uh, happy to take questions and have your comments and uh, and, uh, and uh, further elaborations. 
No, really yeah, appreciate I, I just it. Like Alison, I, I think uh, I think that that was a. It's great great to take the hypothetical and translate it into a case study. Um, so, Jason, go mm -hmm. ahead. I know you want to build on this and uh, and have at it. And if we get some questions online, I'll be sure to pull those in. Yeah, and I'll just I just wanted to build off and compliment Alessandro on the on on your you know the presentation there and the thought process. I completely agree with you. I, you know, I think one of the greatest challenges that we have is um, is standardization. You know, you you mentioned the ISO standards. You mentioned the flexibility in those ISO standards. And I think that flexibility creates problems specifically with you know co-products and those sorts of things. And we really need to be looking at you know how do we make this a fair playing ground to ensure accurate assessment of of carbon footprints and um, one that then can be used just like you said in a uh, collaborative environment in order to share information and, um, and and help the environment together um, there are precedences for doing very similar thing in other parts of the industry so for example in um, in midstream reliability there are groups that look at pipeline reliability that share data between different companies in order to improve modeling and efforts around that and it and um, I think this is ripe for the same sort of action. Um, there are secure ways that we can share information, whether it be blockchain or some other sharing technology that can allow us to all improve on what we do and not give away a competitive advantage, but all of us to prosper and improve the environment and improve, you know, improve our, our every, you know, improve the situation for all of our customers. And I think that's a really good build and thought process. And I, and I really like the way he's headed with it. Yeah, I think Absolutely. great, great point there, Jason. And and I think you get at it too. So there's there's the doing good part of it, but it's not all altruistic. There is an efficiency gain there, and kind of as yeah. in my intro remarks, you know, where we talk about this, that's the competitive advantage where you're not necessarily seeding any specific proprietary information, but being aggressive and capturing that value is basically the difference between survival and extinction. So I, I think that's a that's a great point. And I, what I want to do is, is kind of pull in a question that we had online that tapped into a little bit of this and talking about that, creating that cultural collaboration and, and change. You know, how, how receptive in terms of, of your experiences across the board is management to this? And, and how do we bridge that gap into ensuring that they, they create that culture of collaboration? And how do we move from uh, lagging to potentially leading on some of these digital initiatives. Mm. Any, anybody uh, want to jump on that one? I, I can I Elf? can give a little bit to my, 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 my perspective okay, Elf, here, uh, but but uh, I don't want now to uh, uh, take out take the, the opportunity for other people to uh, also ask. So, but just to be brief, um, definitely. Um, uh, the if it's about to, to, to move something um, inside space inside the company to kick off large transformation a top-down uh, uh, push is is absolutely necessary right um, it helped to launch the initiative of developing all what I was mentioning in, in our case um, three years ago in BSF so it was uh, um, an effort which was definitely strongly um, pushed and, and sponsored by our uh, uh, chief executive officer. Um, but um, then in the end, um, in, if you want to have a, to build trust on a solution, on a standard, you cannot stay within the border of the company. You need to start to join forces with others. Otherwise, it will always be perceived as a, as a solution, which is just one, just partial, right? Linked to one company and not really uh, a trustful solution. So, um, in the end, um, uh, it's about now um, that there are so many industry association groups which meet very regularly. I mean, leveraging those um, for, for such initiatives is, I think, um, um, a good solution. And uh, um, ideally, Take it the most global approach as possible because you don't want to have insular solution, right? We don't want to have a standard which applies only to one single country or, or perhaps one single region. Let's try to be um, um, go very broad when we build when you build this type of uh, um, of a, a consortia. Um, definitely, um, 
more, more, multiple people, maybe not so many to facilitate the process at the very beginning, but try to go global geographically to have a good uh, uh, trust uh, uh, bonus at the beginning. I'm happy to add a little bit to that from just from a technology company perspective, right? Because I think our industry has been rightfully accused of being monolithic in the past, uh, trying to take market share, et cetera. But there's been a fast shift that we've been observing over the, the past few years towards ecosystems. And what we have seen is the necessity to embrace that from a strategic perspective, which I think can translate into, let's say, the operation space as well. You've got to be really clear on your own value proposition confident around it, but then embrace the standards. So one example, and this actually speaks to reliability as well, um, we joined the OpenAI initiative together with Baker Hughes, C3, uh, Shell and Microsoft to be able to, to simulate interoperable uh, artificial intelligence, right? Exchange of ML models across systems for use cases such as, for example, reliability. Uh, that's a way, new way of thinking. So you got to be clear on your value proposition and where you stand, but also acknowledge that from a strategic perspective, this type of exchange of information, exchange of data, it is just the path forward. So we have to basically stimulate for that to happen in a very easy way. Um, for us, it translates into interoperable solutions, uh, plug and play, that makes it easier to innovate. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Rahil? Yeah, so we, we see a lot of collaboration both internal and external. Uh, internal though, we have very, very nice, uh, I would say programs actually of collaboration. We are actually strengthening those programs with trying to create forums for uh, creating high performing team behaviors within the organization. So inculcating more team behavior uh, you know, approaches. But externally, we are doing much more, actually, because most of our products do have quite a good standards, actually, when we sell in the market, the fuels. Fortunately, the fuels do have a very, very uh, good laid down standards across EU and UK. Uh, I have to speak about UK separately now after Brexit. So we, we, we have a lot of collaboration with uh, the industry on quite a few fronts, actually. Uh, we have Tankage Association. Uh, so we have lots of uh, terminal operators, you know, exchanging data and information about uh, sustainability. There is so much going on in cybersecurity, actually, but there's very, very large forums, actually, on collaboration within UK for cybersecurity due to uh, you know, that there's an agenda on uh, uh, supply resilience across the country, uh, which is, you know, there is a UK PIA, there is a base NCSC. So we have, we, have, we have lots of forums actually where we ensure that we, are, we also bring in all the OT suppliers there to discuss about how to strengthen the cybersecurity. And we get lots of threat intelligence and other things from uh, GCHQ. So that there is a collaboration in many, many areas uh, of, of, the, of the industry. I think what we still lack a bit of collaboration is actually in terms of uh, more agility in understanding how how the transitions to the new you know uh, energy uh, is going to really happen uh, we are work, we, there there are so many transitional projects that we have uh, which is hydrogen biofuels and others but uh, there is there is some more collaboration needed actually in that sense although the, the, there is, there are some forums called northwest net zero and uh, northeast net zero and all that but uh, the the, there is this collaborations are actually giving a good results uh, to us so far. I think Brian, yeah, if, you, if, I, if you will let me uh, chime in there. You know, sure, go ahead. We formed our sorry when we formed our digital and analytics group a couple of years ago. Um, one of the the key drivers was establishing a, a, an innovation program and an creating innovation platform where employees can submit their ideas and be a part of solutions. And so that's one way that we've been able to establish a, a culture of collaboration at McDermott. Um, and with that being said, um, one of the ideas that was submitted was um, an idea that led to RxD, which is our carbon footprint tool that enables uh, carbon conscious decision making. 
And it was a collaborative effort between our outstanding sustainability team, engineering and IT. I think, uh, you know, those teams working as a pod, if you will, um, allowed us to really create a groundbreaking tool for an EPC contractor um, in, in McDermott. And we, we're using that um, to better serve our customers and obviously have a positive impact on the environment and to meet our, our sustainability goals. So, you know, in addition, we formed a partnership with Shell to further explore opportunities in uh, sustainability. And so, you know, those are just two examples of how we're collaborating at McDermott. And I wanted to share that with, with the, the audience. Yeah, great, great input there, Elgin. Um, you know, I think we talked about collaboration is key and that's, that's the key theme that's coming out here and that's how we've seen results. You know, Alessandro, I know that you, you pointed to the fact that it has to be led from the top, top down. Um, I think the other part of that too, where that Elgin kind of got at is it's also a little bit of bottom up to, to make sure that what we're doing on the ground resonates with the enterprise as a whole, making sure that there's a feedback loop. So everybody has a stake in what, what's going on and there's buy-in to this mission and going forward and having at it. So that means we need to adapt and, and make our organizations a little bit more structurally different so we can be a little bit more aut autonomous and, and breaking through these silos that we've had in, in history. So what I want to do is, uh, Harvard, I know that you had some, some conversation. We talked a little bit about breaking through those silos, specifically through some of the digital twin work that you've done. So I, I thought maybe you could chime in there and, and share with us a little bit about that and how that's worked in terms of creating new insights and that organizational change um, to, to realize those benefits. Yeah, I'm happy to share on that. So one of the first things we do when we deploy digital twins is to integrate uh, the data foundation from those companies into one unified environment, which we call a digital twin. And we, of course, we progress to add analytics simulation to it so that you can add the value to the you know core business cases that you do identify. But fundamentally, when you're bringing information into one environment, you're starting to build ontologies that people otherwise within their silos would have to build, build themselves based on need. And this is why you know, you have this proliferation of spreadsheets and custom systems and, you know, seemingly random individual initiatives that overlap and, and, you know, with limited governance and oversight, which has put us in the position that we collectively are in today, where we're talking about digitizing for to improve these things, right? So, so when you bring that information together, um, from maintenance information to production information, data, you know, real-time data trending, uh, and you bring it in into one environment, you get a set of opportunities to manage your assets or your portfolio of assets in a more meaningful way. So, so this hits some of the big narratives that the industry has right now. We talked about net zero and how uh, you know downstream operators are going about achieving that in, in a big way is to integrate energy systems like associate wind or solar or hydrogen for electrification of the assets and creating green energy parks. So by putting information together, you can create a basis for a new skill set, and that is to manage across and look at the impacts across the value chain, which is really facilitated by this integrated data set. And that requires you to stop operating in the silo and, and to look up from the silo and ask, okay, if I take this action, what is the impact on the feedstock or the electricity consumption or my downstream customers? Which of course, if you sit at the very high level in the organization, people are gonna say, go, so what? We're already doing that. But as you go down in the organization, you realize that you have silos where you have suboptimal optimizations. We need to bring it up to a level. And that's something you can facilitate with uh, bringing that information into context. And then you can start talking about advanced use cases. But it really is, you know, the way we see the operation uh, going forward is more as an integrated energy system with also with multiple stakeholders. So, so you can start doing that by leveraging digital twin as a tool to drive information into one unified work surface. And then you start addressing the organization as an integrated organization and define the roles that have the metrics that actually allows individuals to succeed 
and operating in that way. Yeah, yeah. great, great point there. Um, Alessandro, go ahead. I know you wanted to add a little bit of that and then we'll move on to a little bit more about knowledge sharing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's about, uh, the, I mean, Ava, you were discussing about breaking data silos. Um, and that's, uh, it was exactly, um, or is still exactly a key challenge um, for uh, the rollout of the initiative we was talking about before. Um, in order to determine carbon footprint, for example, you need to access already within the borders of one company, uh, very, very different data sets, right, uh, related to emissions uh, related to costing, related to procurement, related to, to, to manufacturing and, uh, and, and sales information, supply chain. So um, a lot of data that needs to come together um, to allow uh, product come for print determination. Um, but then if you think about them uh, going beyond the boundary of the company, then you need to break data silos uh, of every single company and, and, and get uh, uh, data together. Um, and uh, is, is breaking data silos is one aspect and breaking uh, organizational silos is another one. Um, just to give you a glimpse, uh, in, in order to realize this solution for, digit, for, for product cover for print determination, um, we need to have uh, um, task forces uh, encompassing very, very, very different competencies from accounting to uh, sustainability, of course, like cycle assessments, to um, technology, so production technology, procurement, and finally also the business people, because uh, product cover for print is probably up, about to become the currency of the future. So having, um, 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 having cross-functional teams is uh, fundamental to have such initiatives going. And that probably ties well to the next topic, I assume, right? Yeah, no, I think that's a great segue into the next uh, next topic. We're talking about competencies, and I think that gets at how do we leverage some of those competencies and those those key experienced people and, and skill sets that we have across our organizations, and how do we translate that into creating a a digital mindset and and an ecosystem in which these opportunities can thrive. So how do we leverage that? Is it something where we go across an organization and push wholesale into uh, to try to implement change? Or is that something where we, we try to target, you know, different parts of the organization to maximize that potential? Uh, Elgin, I know we talked a little bit about this in terms of adoption. And uh, so I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, Brian. So one of the things that we're doing at McDermott is, uh, you know, we've established communities of practice where our SMEs um, share functional insights with their counterparts and frontline staff across the organization. So, you know, anything from, you know, pipeline design to sub CXD program or our Gemini XD program, or even electrical engineering, which is near and dear to me, um, we, we share that, that data, that insight, those best practices uh, with our communities of practice. And so that's one of the ways that we, we're sharing knowledge and collaborating. In addition, we, we formed um, a, a Teams environment using Microsoft Teams, also social media platforms internally where employees can uh, share ideas uh, from a click of a button or using their phone, they can add ideas or ask questions. You know, when we're looking at a global organization like McDermott, where we have offices in Chennai, Gurgaon, Houston, London, you know, we need to be able to collaborate sometimes real time. And what that means is being able to have platforms available so that employees can share ideas and ask questions um, and get solutions to their problems that they're facing. So, uh, you know, communities of practice, setting up platforms to allow knowledge sharing are key to successful. Um, collaboration in, in organizations. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really great point in terms of trying to get that, that adoption out there. And I think you know, the reality is if we take a step back, technology can be scary uh, to an organization for all the opportunity it presents. If we look at the enterprise, uh, is my job going away? Am I going to be able to learn this skill? And I think getting people comfortable with the fact that 
innovation and digital implementation actually can benefit them is a key part of that. And that's where this knowledge sharing and capturing skills in order to build out that future state uh, becomes really essential. I mean, it's it's called the uh, the adoption matrix, right? Where where you're trying to get from people who feel totally disenfranchised or don't feel capable um, or, or don't feel that the organization has the buy-in to it, to, to creating effectively evangelists who, who totally believe in that mission and move into that upper quadrant where you're going to get that, that result and outcome. And I think that's one of the key things that we can focus on as an organization. That kind of gets into uh, the final point here that we wanted to cover, which is, which is upskilling. And I think that is, you know, essential and crucial as we move forward and have, have conversations about how we execute and unlock that value. It's, uh, we've seen a lot of change after post pandemic with great resignation and a lot of people moving around. Talent is very expensive. So you can hire some new people in. You have experienced people and you have new people, but you also have an existing workforce. So how do you maximize that workforce? And, and provide opportunities such as, as training to get people on board with that. Uh, any any inputs there, Jason? I can, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, Elgin, you, we'll get to you next. Really quickly, I, you know, you, you said it uh, perfectly, you know, it's a generational issue. You know, we have a, a, a nice mix of Gen X, millennials, baby boomers, and all of them are at different stages of that, that change curve, that Rogers adopted type curve. And so uh, what we thought was beneficial was to, you know, establish small bites of information for them and also to normalize um, some of the key terms and messages centered around digital transformation. So for us, it was, well, what is digital culture, right? What is digital transformation? What is digital digitalization? What is digitization? And so we were, you know, sort of establishing a normalization point or thread across our organization in order to facilitate learning um, amongst all generational um, employees. Over to you, Jason. Fantastic. Yeah, I think yeah, you know, I think that's a great point, Elgin. Uh, you know, it's it's one of the observations I made when I was not in digital, but I was in in, our tr in a trading organization. And we had a wide range of, of different generations of people in the organization. I think one of the things that that younger folks bring into an organization are is, is new ways of thinking about learning and how they and how they solve problems. So you'd see people that had you know 20, 30 years of experience, like I do. We 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 would rely on our traditional ways to solve a problem. People coming in um, that are you know, more my kids' age, they, they approach a problem in a completely different way. They dive right in and start searching for potential analogous solutions that they can apply to the problems that they're having. And I think one of the great advantages you get out of that is by developing relationships with a wide variety of different people, you, you get different perspectives and you get that diversity of thought that leads to an expansion and upskilling of your organization. Um, you know, kind of segue a little bit back to kind of where we were, you know, we talked a little bit about knowledge sharing and how do we um, facilitate and get people sharing knowledge across industries and organizations. You know, I think that's one of the things that that we can do as as an industry is to start looking at are there analogies that we can use to prep our executive leadership teams on how to share knowledge, when to share knowledge and maybe business models that exist today that um, that haven't existed for a long time, but but can be used as a as an analogy for how we would share knowledge. I you know I, I think about um, reliability, I think is a great one. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, you know sustainability in, in, as an analogy. You know, I think I think about the open source software industry. You know, there's that's kind of the epitome of sharing. They're they're sharing their product at least part of their product um, with the world so that they can understand and increase the usability of their product. They can innovate their product and then they can build off that. So they've got a they've got an open source component and a freely shared component that helps everyone. And then they've got a, another component that builds off of that open source platform to, to enhance their own business. And so how can we share our sustainable informa information so that we can help everyone and also retain a certain amount of knowledge and expertise that allows us to give us a competitive advantage while also sharing that information. And so, you know, just to kind of circle back on the upskilling, 
upskilling occurs across the entire organization. It goes all the way from the C-suite, you know, all the way to the frontline employee. And the question becomes, how do we best change the way we think so that we recognize potential opportunities that are in front of us? Absolutely, yeah, Jason. Absolutely. I, yeah, I think that's... Go, go, go ahead, Alessandro. Who was it? Was no, that... sorry yes, for, for interjecting, uh, Brian. But I, I think that um, um, if I could add some one thing, there is something that uh, the pandemic has really um, uh, brought to us as a, a very positive uh, um, fallout, right? So it's uh, the... I don't know whether you observe the same, but there was definitely... A, a tremendous and exponential increase in the uh, offering and uh, and also in the adoption of uh, digital learning opportunities and, and platforms. Um, it is much easier, uh, thanks to such platforms, uh, for <clears throat> companies also to set, set up programs, uh, internal or external, to upskill workforce um, rather than sending people to um, to a classroom uh, or to a business school or to somewhere else, um, it's it, the information and, and training can uh, can be done much more effectively and customized uh, to uh, to the need of, of of the of the people and of the workforce. So I think that's one aspect that I would say was a positive outcome out of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, which I could observe. Excellent point, Alessandro. I, I think we're coming pretty close to time. So I, is there anybody who wants to chime in on this? I, I saw that we have maybe one or two questions uh, in, the, in the box. And if anybody does have any questions, feel free to, to reach out. Anybody want to continue on the upscale or I can kind of pull this into, uh, into the station here? All right, with that, I'll kind of pull it into the station. So yeah, I think we talked about it. It's about continuous learning. It's about trying to leverage that culture and implement that change. It's a total mindset shift from where we've been historically on, on an existential level. And that's the difference between, you know, exist, you know, survival and, and existence is totally inherent to achieving that change. And that starts at the C-suite and it goes down to everybody throughout the organization. We have to create that impassioned and energetic, um, culture that's going to get us through this volatility and change and that's going to be the differentiator between success that's that's where you get from creation to cultivation to uh, culmination um you know of of those ideas and i think there's a lot of potential out there and i think enabling and empowering and especially the upskilling which we can't undersell is going to be the key to extracting that value so i'm going to pivot into the uh, the questions here uh, I think we had one or two. Um, so anybody feel free to jump in on this. Is our industry considering lessons learned from integrated operations initiative practices over the years at the level of uh, large industry? Anybody have any comments on that? No? I, sure I, I think I think. Oh, I would say I think the point to that uh, that question really is. I, I think we all need to internalize. We need to look at lessons learned across the industry and beyond because there are opportunities. Kind of what Jason was saying for us to get this right. We haven't been necessarily at the forefront of digital adoption and innovation. So the good news is, you know, that's that's a challenge. But the good news is there are a lot of lessons learned that we can leverage as we go forward with implementation of this and as we evolve as an industry. So that that's my answer to that. Does, any, does anybody have anything that they'd like to add to that question response? Yeah, I'll just add real quick. You know, sure. I think one of the misconceptions about all of our industries is the level of innovation that occurs. We've been innovating for well over a century, right? And you think about the innovations that occur within our organization. Yeah, they haven't always been digital. They haven't always been in specific spaces. There's a long history of innovation. And we need to tap that long history of innovation and extend that into new ways of innovating in our organization. And we need to do a better job of explaining to young people that can come work for us that that already exists. We need people to understand within our organizations that, that we are innovators. 
and um, and we need to build off of that that long history and really drive to new changes. Great, Jason. Um, yeah, so I, I think we've kind of captured that, and uh, what well, with that, we need to kind of close out. So I appreciate the participation of the panel. Thank you for your time, everybody who's listened in. I think the point here is that the human element is one of the most important elements of how we go forward and capture the power of digital innovation and value across value chains. Um, and that's the, that's the key. For every tool that you have, it's only as good as how you implement it. And the human element is probably one of the most critical. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to follow up with us. I hope you found this valuable and let's go forward and build a future. I love that panel. I wish I went on a bit because um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about, I think the last couple of questions that were put into the, uh, the chat box, it was actually quite interesting to sort of have a bit more of an expansion because on that panel, there were different types of companies. I was very interested to know um, Elgin's view versus um, Alessandro's versus Jason's. It, it was really good to sort of see that. And then you had um, Havard who went in from a technology aspect, which always is exciting because then you see it from a, a tech point of view, how you integrate change management uh, as well. So I really liked it. And I liked um, Rahul's contribution. Um, Rahul was, you know, fantastic speaker, but also very experienced as a CIO of Essa Oil. And I think that was, it was a good collection of, um, of opinions um, on this particular topic. And I think it's important to have that in a discussion that not people doing the same role or the same place, but actually different different opinions coming together. Um, I love the start of it with the death grip um, analogy, Brian. Uh, it was brilliantly moderated, by the way, uh, from yourself. Um, but also I think what, what left me um, at the end was engaging people right at the beginning of the journey. I think the problem with change management is if you don't engage people from the beginning, how do you expect them to be involved when you when you involve them from the middle? It, it just doesn't make sense. And I think that's a really, really significant point that was raised quite a bit actually on this discussion. Um, and I love what Jason said at the end about diversity of thought. You know, you look at a company, you've got different generations working in a company, but what's really important is diversity of thought. Um, from everyone and how you bring that all together. So fantastic panel, loved it, absolutely brilliant.